Anyway, we've got a few minutes. I don't know if anybody has a question. If you do, please. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how much the, uh, the, 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 the people who are deeply involved in critical race theory, such as the Marxist side, is really invested in the racial part of it, or is, is that just a means to an end? And, and uh, uh, environmentalism or, or uh, other kinds of things could, could, could just as easily fill that void. But racism happens to resonate with us right now. Yeah, that's a good question. The overarching political philosophy of critical race theory is socialism, because only a socialist government can fix all the iniquity, inequalities uh, that are out there, supposedly. Hmm. Uh, Abraham X. Kendi says this very clearly. He says that capitalism necessarily leads to racism, so you have to destroy capitalism to destroy racism. So whether you're talking about like neo-colonial theory or radical environmentalism, the end result is always the state taking over one area of life after another because there's the fear of freedom. It's like the state, and I'm, I'm invoking Rushduni again, in an atheistic worldview, the state becomes a de facto god. Mm -hmm. And so the state has to bring unity and the state has to bring meaning and the state brings order out of chaos. It's a profoundly non-Christian perspective. And you, you got to wonder if these people have ever been to the DMV. <laughs> you know, you, you want to turn the entire world the into the world DMV. The whole world is a big DMV you know, now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that could be our next dystopian novel. <laughs> DMV world. Stuck, stuck at the DMV. <laughs> That's, I got my number. <laughs> yeah, Scott. All right. Well, um, I guess, I, you know, Doug, or uh, you know, if anyone else has a thought on this, I'd love to hear your thoughts. But... Um, so my question is this, so obviously historically in American society, there were times where the law actually did enforce inequality, mm -hmm. and perhaps the church uh, didn't do enough uh, then to rectify that wrong. Um, I think that in terms of actual laws on the books, obviously some people would argue with me, but I think in this room we all agree, those official laws are, are gone, right? And yet we still have inequality. And it seems to me, from my view of how I read the Bible and, and God has created that, inequality just seems like it's something that's baked into creation. I mean, different people are gifted with different things, different, mm -hmm. love, different life circumstances, different countries are located in different areas. I mean, it just seems like it's impossible. So where I, what my question is, is how do we balance that out as, as Christians? Like, because a lot of times I hear the Christian virtue is, well, no, equality, absolute equality, that is a Christian virtue. We really we ought to strive for that. Uh, I question that. I, I don't actually think that that is a valid Christian virtue. But I'm curious to hear your all, your all thoughts on, is that at what level and, and how might we go about, what's a healthy way to go about promoting some sort of equality versus what is just inherent inequality that has to be there and it will be there? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. Please. Define equality. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess, and, and that's a good question, because I would say most of the people that are arguing for it, they never define it. I guess for, for my use, um, well, yeah, there is no concept of equality that I can think of that, that I could actually offer you. But I think um, closer to um, everyone has all of their needs taken care of and has a little bit of surplus. And there's nobody with way more than they could ever use or pass on. Yeah, we, we know the problem with that, and I, I understand your point, and that's how a lot of people would s define the equality that they long for, that human beings, though, just don't uh, stop there. We are voracious, and uh, our appetites are, are, can never be fully satisfied. So even if we were to find ourselves in a situation where we were able to achieve this within a lifetime, there would be inequities because there would be some people that would be terribly motivated to better their, their circumstances and mm -hmm. suddenly you find yourself with a new set of in in inequities. Um, any thoughts, Doug? Well, I think if, if inequalities are directly due to wrongful discrimination, that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. and that was certainly true in the United States up through the Jim Crow laws and even things like redlining and so on. But another... African-American social thinker that I respect very much is a guy named Robert Woodson, yeah. who founded yeah. the Woodson Center. Yeah. And he makes the point, you mentioned this earlier, that even after 
slavery during Reconstruction, a lot of African American families and communities thrived, yeah. even though they were not given legitimate economic opportunities and legal protections. They basically said, all right, you white folks still don't like us, you're still discriminated against, against us, we'll show you by building schools and building roads. And Thomas Sowell points this out too, you look at a lot of indicators of social success in the African American community, like up until, I don't know, about 1960 or 50, being kind of vague, they're, they're pretty strong, family structure, education, lack of criminal, criminality, and then they start to ascend after that. Well, what happened? The Great Society, the yeah. war on poverty, yeah. statism, welfareism. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. So people say, well, all the problems that African Americans have are the result of slavery. You know, and people like Thomas Sowell say, well, did they kind of leapfrog over that period where African Americans were doing really well, even under unjust laws, like Jim Crow laws and so on? What happened is slavery stopped having that bad effect, and then it kicked in again somehow in the 1960s? And, and we've seen some of the pathologies that black America has labored with for a while now spreading. So I, I remember when I was in Boston, I was involved in urban ministry, I had a friend named Ray Hammond. He was a, just a brilliant man, African-American, went to Harvard when he was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, he told me one time, he says, you, the problem is you guys think this stuff can be kind of sealed, that it won't spread. Huh. Uh, it will. Yeah. So you're going to have the same kinds of stuff happening in the white community that you see right yeah, now in the black community, and he was absolutely right. Yeah. You know, you take a guy like J.D. Vance and, you know, Hillbilly Elegy, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, you know, where you have communities today that are, you know, white communities, so to speak, with 40%... Uh, out of wedlock births. That was African-American communities in the 70s. And yeah, now you see the, the drug epidemic and, yeah. and the, the way in which that has affected kind of working in middle class and even upper middle class oh, typical yeah. white yeah. families now. It's, it's <sighs> astronomical. Oh, yeah. Uh, up and outers is what I refer to uh, when I think about... So I had a friend named Roger... Uh, Dewey, uh, he was a, uh, involved in urban ministry in Boston, and then overnight he became a chaplain at, an, at a very uh, tony uh, 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 school, boys' school in New England, uh, kind of a you know boarding school. And I asked him, I said, Roger, you were, you're in the inner city at one point, now you're out there with all of these super wealthy kids, and he said to me, Chris, it's the same stuff. Yep. The only difference is the money. Yeah. So, you know, absentee fathers, drug use, um, just all kinds of sexual insanity. It's these kids who are growing up in these, the, the differences are money, connections, and education. They have those advantages. That's true. That's, that distinguishes them. But they're a mess. Yeah. You, you and I both know a lot of these people. Yeah. Um, they're just a mess. Yeah. And um, so I refer to them as up and outers. Down and outers and up and outers have a whole lot in common. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the comment about uh, the Great Society program, a uh, quick story. My mother taught in inner city Newark. Um, as a matter of fact, when the riots happened in 1968, in the days between the riots, they took my brothers and me and stuck us in the car and drove us down to the ghetto to explain what was happening and why. Um, so uh, at one point she was visiting her kids. She was going to visit the families. And she mentioned that one of them, um, uh, his father didn't live in the house. And I asked why. This was outside of my range of experience um, in the suburbs. And she said, well, it's because of welfare. And I said, what's that got to do with it? And they said, well, the government gives a certain amount of money to the families. But if the father is in the home, they assume the father has a job, and therefore they give them less money. The problem is there are no jobs. Uh, but So in order to get the money that the family needs to live, the father has to move out. I said, that's crazy. My mother said, those are the rules. Yeah, I saw it was that effect that created 
the absentee fathers in the black communities. Right. It was a direct consequence. Now, they're well-intentioned policies. We want to give the money to the people who really need it, and we want to be responsible and not give it to people who don't really need it. Great. But the way they implemented that idea was disastrous. And I find very, very few people who are willing to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Charles, so Murray, gotta, Charles Murray wrote about that, gosh, 25, 30 years ago in a book called Losing Ground. Oh, yeah, I remember he that book. detailed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. we got time for a couple more questions. Yeah. So I wanted, um, I really appreciated your, your quote from Pascal as you ended um, there earlier. Mm -hmm. And really the last five minutes of, of the podcast was really about this idea that, um, yeah, if, if we can't set any standards, if we can't say this is better than that, and we're kind of we're kind of at an impasse, but it seems to me that's exactly where we're at. Is that <laughs> to say this way of living or this decision is better? To take biblical truth and then actually apply it, even for a pastor to do that, in many cases, is entirely offensive. Even when you're doing it with people that are basically social conservatives, and uh, <laughs> and it's a very disconcerting thing to. To, to witness and to deal with. So I guess we wanted to just get y'all's thoughts, like practically, how do we get back to some sort of, some sort of, uh, um, I don't even know what the right word is, just uh, how do we help people? How do we help people in our churches? How do we help people in our families um, come to an acknowledgement that, that yes, that we can say this is better than that. I mean, we can say that, uh, that there are standards and that, um, yeah, that there are, Things that are always better, you know, regardless of where you're at in human history. You know, how can we how can we get back there? Because it seems that until we do, everyone just says, "Oh, that's great that you're doing it that way. I'm going to do it this way." And there's not anything that we have to talk about here. Yeah, I guess uh, one thing we can do is pointed outcomes, but that takes time. Uh, but I think though that we also have because of the fact that we're made in the image of God. They know, we know. We're suppressing the truth. Even in the church, we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And that requires uh, somebody to tell the truth, to confront it, but then there's going to be a fallout. So um, I have a friend who's a controversial pastor, and he's got a church that's grown remarkably. That He told me one time it was, we got to the location that we are now by crawling over broken glass. It was broken glass the whole way. <laughs> you know, we have this idea that this is just going to be one happy experience after another, and the next thing you know, we've got this huge worldwide ministry. No, <laughs> it's just painful and bloody and, and full of uh, disappointment the whole way. Uh, you know, you just read the New Testament, and you just see the Apostle Paul uh, remark, making offhanded remarks about this guy and that guy and how that guy betrayed him. and <laughs> right. It's just all over the place. Yeah. I, I would suggest tactically um, you sneak up on them. <laughs> uh, so you start with a biblical exegesis, biblical principles, deal with it on a theological level, and then you know, you'll, they'll follow you for that because it's abstract. But then point out what the direct consequences of that are for our behavior. And this is the way God designed things and it's gonna work best. So you, you, don't, you don't address it directly. You, like say, you sneak up on them. You get it, you, you start with something that they're going to agree with, you know, or at least not object to, and then move from there into the, the application. So I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up. I know I noted uh, that I, we had time for two questions, but the one question went longer than I thought. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, thank you. We're, we're going to do a couple things. One is we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time with uh, Ben Dunson to learn about the American Reformer. So it's going to be a, a kind of a brief kind of pugette moment, <laughs> just kind of talking to him. And then we've got George Grant, and George is going to come up, and we're going to spend time talking to George. And, um, uh, can I, can I throw in one comment? Sure. By Doug's book. Yeah. yeah. I, I read a, um, a pre-pub version of it. It's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.